Hello, happy Friday. Welcome to week, uh, the end of week four. We are really coming to the, uh, uh, coming through this in, in really fast order. Um, I'm, I'm constantly blown away by how fast this module system is going. Uh, this week, uh, we spent a lot of time talking about political systems, about what happens in political systems when racial and ethnic and cultural and linguistic differences are embedded within that system. We spent a lot of time investigating China. What I want to do today is use all that material to kind of create a more like a comprehensive idea and, and theory of what what is it that China wants? How should those of us who are ordinary citizens of the United States and how should the United States and the Western world itself um, look at China and interact with China? Um, and, and how is China going to be, from their own perspective, looking at the world that they also inhabit um, as well? So what does China want and what can we do? Um, and where is their middle ground to find? That is going to be the uh, topic for today's Friday asynchronous video, right? So let me start with the assumption. Um, this might be something you've heard before. Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But um, for decades, really since the 1970s, American foreign policy, and by extension, Western foreign policy, is operated and, and dealt with China based on the following assumption. The idea was, as China developed, and as China grew into a larger economic force than it currently was, they would slowly start to do the following three things. They would start to play by the rules, right? Play by those international rules of human rights or of economic systems. They would open their markets and it would become a much more uh, open trading partner. And they would privatize their economy by and large, would give up state control over various things that were currently under, that were currently under state control. And the assumption then followed that if those three things happened, right, and, and, and China China's growing, China is welcomed into the institutions of the world system, right, like the UN, the uh, uh, World Trade Organization, so on and so forth, that that would then promote democratization. We've always assumed that as China liberalized economically, they would start to liberalize politically. And this would be helped, it was believed, by many Chinese expats who would come to the United States, let's say, for college or for grad school and then go back to take jobs in China. They would get used to freedoms of democracy. It's the idea, at least. And they would push their governments at home. Instead, this really has not happened. Instead, what we have seen is that China has developed into and, and continues to forcibly promote a very closed off system economically and politically, a very authoritarian system economically, politically, and now as you see in the film, culturally. And this model has been now established pretty firmly as a democratic alternative, right? As an alternative to, to countries and, and to peoples who may be somewhat skeptical about democracy in the first place. And most troublingly to the people who make political decisions in the United States, they export it globally, right? It's starting to get implemented in other parts of the world. And that, from the perspective of the State Department, is probably the more troubling thing. And so many would argue, and, and I, I, I kind of think I agree with this. Um, it's probably not quite that simple culturally, but, but when it comes to politics and economics, I do agree that this can threaten to create a new type of global order that will likely make the world less free and less safe. And that's a weird thing to say because like, is the world really that free or that safe right now? Um, well, a value judgment would clearly say no, but uh, a more 
on the ground reading of the facts would tell you that, yeah, in a lot of ways, we started the 21st century in a better position than we started the 20th century. Um, and, and many of the gains that we've had have not been totally rolled back, even in the face of like really poisonous economic inequality and some um, really jarring ethnic and cultural violence and, and some democratic backsliding in many areas. Um, that's the big threat, right? If, Ch if the Chinese model becomes the normative view especially of something like human rights, a lot of people, myself included, are not convinced that that will serve the world well. And so that that's a remaking of an order that we're realizing was never really that stable to begin with. And so you enter China as a real player into this system. Right? This is part of the clash of civilizations argument that non-Western countries cease to be places where you can just look at them as stuff is happening to them. And instead, they are active participants in shaping world history going forward. This collides with the Chinese philosophy and, and ideology to think about the world in much longer stretches of time than most Americans do. We think in election cycles. It's a byproduct of our democracy. Chinese regime thinks it's centuries and sometimes even longer than that. So it's a very long time continuously running civilization. And it's very common to hear Chinese political leadership and Chinese um, economic powers talk about the era of colonialism, right? And talk about old dynasties going back to 200 AD, uh, 200 BCE, I should say. Um, and, and what China's realized for the first time now, in a long time, China's realizing they don't really need the USA anymore. The time that China entered the World Trade Organization, they needed the United States to be their benefactor, essentially. Um, not so much politically, right? They had control of their people. But economically speaking, they needed the U.S. to usher them in and be, be a really core trading partner. China doesn't really need that anymore. They used to have a much bigger population and a much smaller economy. Now they're an economic peer and, and will become the, the world's largest economy at some point in the next 10 to 15 years. And so my argument would be, and I'm not the only one who makes it for the record, but that China believes that right here, right now, the next few decades, and maybe maybe even shorter than that, that the Chinese are faced with a very narrow window in which they can remake the world and remake it fundamentally in a way that benefits the interests of Beijing. And they're very motivated to push that forward right now. They want to do it before the world, like get it started really, before the world beats back COVID, because that will happen, before their economy goes in the tank because that will, like the Chinese economy is not as stable as you think it is. If we have all these problems with our economic, you know, ebbs and flows, the Chinese system is far from perfect, right? It's like, let's not, we can't make the assumption that that everything in China is, is perfect and inevitable. No, in, 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 instead, um, what you see in China is that the stock market is a complete roller coaster. And many of the actions of um, like pseudo private sectors in China really rely upon the support of the state in order to maintain their investments. China also is motivated to act before their population gets old. That's actually a very common cause of a core country becoming not core anymore or starting to lose some of its economic and, and, and social dynamism. China's got a young population, but not so young that it causes a lot of instability. Um, before social graying sets in, um, China's motivated to act. And, and maybe most importantly, before their neighbors, especially in Asia, realize what's going on. It's, it's not that they don't realize what's going on, but um, we, we haven't seen the kind of cross-national Asian uh, diplomacy that would be required to contain China's maybe less savory ambitions throughout the world. When I say something like a less savory ambition, um, you know, a good example of that would clearly be what you saw in the documentary film, this, this, this issue in the Northwest province of Xinjiang, where you simply don't have anything even approximating human rights. So that's the situation. And at this point, the way that China views people, the way that China views culture, and the way that China views human rights is really well known. 
that idea of over time, China would democratically uh, legitimize itself and it would start to play by these rules of human rights and, 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 res and respect of common values. I think we can let that go at this point. China's given us enough evidence that their views on human rights are pretty well known. And, and you know, look, I, I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm only singling out China. There are many countries that have skeletons both historically in their closet and uh, long running issues of systematic and institutional discrimination that continue to disadvantage ethnic, cultural, religious minorities within these areas. Um, our country also being a prime example of this. But this is a globalization class, right? If you care about the US, go take that class next semester. Um, China's completely remade Tibet. And they realized like in the 90s, China's real serious crackdown on Tibet, it caught them a lot of crap cross-nationally. And yeah, they got condemned at the UN. And yeah, there were some minor kind of sanctions going on. But ultimately what you saw in Tibet, it's a pretty successful crackdown, at least in terms of what the Chinese wanted out of it. And so that region has been completely ethnic, like culturally neutered to the point where like there's just almost no public displays of uh, classic Tibetan culture that, that were there uh, not that long ago. And so the Chinese regime, I think, kind of looked around at that point and said, wow, that was easy. And it was pretty cheap. Um, all it took was a little patience to let the rest of the world stop caring. And that's being repeated now, not just in the Xinjiang concentration camps, not just in the surveillance state that's taken hold across the mainland, but there's also a sort of lesser known crackdown occurring on Christianity. Um, believe it or not, uh, even though there's no like state re a religion is, is heavily regulated and controlled by the state in China, but uh, nevertheless, Catholicism, and I believe Presbyterianism are two of the fastest growing affiliations in China. And there's been a pretty severe crackdown on that as well, to the point where it actually led to a condemnation from the leader of the Catholic world, from Pope, uh, Pope, Pope Francis. Um, and, and so it put kind of Beijing and, and the Vatican on a bit of a collision course for, you know, uh, how the Christian religion is going to be treated there, you know, and, and, and Pope Francis is old enough to have seen Tibet and, 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 and start to get extremely worried about that. China very recently has started to really tighten its grip on Hong Kong. China doesn't need Hong Kong anymore. That's the fundamental problem. We keep thinking of Hong Kong, well, not we, but Hong Kong is not what it was in 1997 when it was handed over from the British as a wealthy democracy to the uh, Chinese. Because at that time, in 1997, China or uh, Hong Kong represented 18% of China's economy. Now it's 3%. They're not afraid of Hong Kong anymore. And they're not afraid of the economic force that Hong Kong could bring, you know, come grinding to a halt. We've also seen... Um, uh, uh, China get very aggressive, at least um, politically, with Taiwan. Now, that is a much tougher. Taiwan is not Chinese territory. They say it is, but nobody recognizes that. So um, Hong Kong was an easier thing to crack down upon because like, they had the ability to move troops and, and, and to start infecting the institutions of Hong Kong. Ty Taiwan is a completely separate and independent government, and so that's a very different story. <laughs> So it's simpler, like, again, China, there's a lot of talk, like, well, well, China will do this or China will do that. I think it's far simpler to take China at the meaning of their actions. China is not going to economically liberalize, not anytime soon. And China is not going to all of a sudden start respecting human rights. And China is not all of a sudden going to open up the doors to those Uyghur Muslim concentration camps and say, we're sorry. It's much simpler to just say China's actions tell you where they stand and what they want and how they view the world. And when I say they, for the record, like I, I'm not trying to paint with a broad brush here. There are many incredibly brave democracy activists operating in, in uh, China. When I say they, I'm speaking mostly about the Chinese regime, right? What is the government saying, doing, and why are they doing and saying? 
And so China's attempts at control, right? Like, oh, actually, let me, let me go backwards here. If I go here, like Tibet, Christianity, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Xinjiang, all of that is sort of internal control. The surveillance state is definitely internal control of the mainland. China's attempts to do this really extend very far behind, beyond their borders. And so there's three things I want to make you aware of um, that represent China's attempt to be the coronation of the 21st century. First is what's called Made in China 2025. That's an attempt to make them, at first it was an attempt to make them technologically self-sufficient. So they wouldn't have to export, you know, uh, innovation or um, telecommunications things from, from elsewhere. And uh, and that's been really, really successful at making it the, the really the technological leader uh, throughout the world, which they have used to create this uh, surveillance state and social credit system. So the Made in China 2025, like that, that you know, is kind of drawing on a popular buzzword at, at the time uh, about how everything is made in China. Um, what if like literally everything was made in China? Um, the second is the Belt and Road Initiative. This is an attempt to cross Eurasia and the Pacific um, to build up and heavily invest in infrastructure throughout these countries. It's kind of like a new Silk Road, um, if, if you remember your history classes, um, that, that um, links China with um, Eurasia and, and the rest of, of, um, of, of their neighboring areas. The Belt and Road Initiative, like fundamentally, like China's really built up a lot of infrastructure, built up their cities, but externally, they've also funded infrastructure projects a la what the World Bank has always done in many countries and recreated that cycle of debt diplomacy and debt uh, and, and the creation of debt regimes that then become very politically subservient to the Chinese regime. And then finally, the military civil fusion. Uh, this is a lesser known thing, but it's a policy among the Chinese regime that any part of the civil re realm of China, so that would be universities, telecommunications companies, chemical research, right, all sorts of things. Um, Anything that's happening there can be co-opted for military use, right? There's no laws set, like there's no separation of church and state between um, this, the civilian re realm and, and, the, and the military realm uh, in China. And so that's allowed them access to a tremendous amount of, um, how do I want to put this? It's given them access to a tremendous amount of knowledge and know-how, and, and it can be sort of seized at will, and that's built up the defense uh, capabilities of China. And then finally, they just steal shit, like all the time, right? There's intellectual theft. Um, th there's no country that's more, you know, complicit in intellectual theft. Um, and sometimes this is just intellectual coercion of, of rights. Um, in order for uh, companies to do business in China, often they have to sign on to agreements that like they will, they agree to basically transfer any of their technology over to China. Now, why on earth would you do this? Well, it's an unbeatable growing market for companies that are always motivated by those increased profits. Remember, companies and every it needs to grow. It's not enough to just say you make money, you gotta grow. And that is the profit motive built into our post-industrial post system is motivating a lot of this. Everybody's willing to make compromises if it means getting access to 1 billion consumers in China. And so over time, as China has like put its roots down in many other parts of the world, 23 nations are now in debt distress to China, not unlike how nations were in debt distress to the United States or the IMF in the, in the, in the latter part of the last century. Um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And that's before we get to the inner, like the coercion that can occur here, which I already sort of talked about. There was like the intellectual theft and intellectual coercion um, in the market. It, it's not just that you might have to transfer technology or, or property rights, but in the market, foreign companies often are forced into compliance with Chinese ideologies. And we've seen this twice in the last year with major brands. The first is Marriott, right? One, it wasn't even the Marriott brand itself. It was one employee of, of Marriott that tweeted something uh, about, something critical of the Chinese regime. All Marriott hotels in China got shut down for a full week after that. And China had to fire that employee and issue an apology because China is an unbeatable market for any type of service sector industry. 
And the second was the general manager of the Houston Rockets. So if you follow basketball, this is probably something you heard about over uh, over last summer. Um, uh, Daryl Morey, the, the GM of the, of the Rockets, tw uh, tweeted something about the pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. Just said, stand for freedom, stand for Hong Kong. Houston Rockets games were blacked out in China for the rest of the year, and the NBA was blocked out in China for months. It's estimated that this will cost the NBA hundreds of millions of dollars to lose access to the Chinese subscription markets. And when it comes down to it, everybody seems to bow down to the power of the Chinese markets. And that is what China is learning more than anything else, because they've always had a large country. They've always had a powerful military, you know, with at least regionally. What they haven't always had is the ability to flex their economic muscle in a way that can actually bend society to the will of the Chinese way of doing things. And as long as everybody fears that they lose access to the Chinese market, that that's going to tank them, that will continue. This is the point where it's tempting to just say that, like, all right, well, look, China is going to be the power of the world going forward. So you might as well just sort of get on board with that and see where it goes. Um, the fundamental question for many right now is, like, do we view, quote unquote, Western values as a strength or as a weakness? How do we view these things? China looks at things like democracy and freedom and human rights and generally views them as state level weaknesses. Maybe they're a nice idea in theory. But the regime feels that they're a weakness and they fight against it very heavily. It's not quite that simple. It's not just that China thinks that Western values are a weakness, but the Chinese regime has always been afraid of values of democracy and human rights. And look no further than Taiwan for an example of that. Taiwan's this tiny little holdover where the overthrown Chinese regime fled after the Civil War in, in 1953 um, and set up shop and, and, and attract, you know, it has been, been generally supported by the United States militarily and economically ever since. China is a thriving, stable, safe democracy. And it's right on China's doorstep. In my, in my judgment, China doesn't, isn't like, China, sometimes, let me, let me start over. It's sometimes interpreted that China wants to absorb Hong Kong because they view it as the last remaining humiliation of the 20th century. I don't think that's really what's happening here. I'm sure there are some in like cultural sectors of the Chinese regime that, that do view it that way. But what the reason why China feels threatened by Tibet, or Taiwan, pardon me, Taiwan, is very simply because it, it's right next door. It's an example of how a non-Chinese system can actually work and work well and work functionally. And that is what they don't want their people realizing or seeing. All right, so what's the way forward? There is a type of ethnocentrism that's really common among Americans and um, less so among Europeans, but it's a little bit there too. We tend to interpret the world purely in relation to the United States, right? China's got meaning in terms of what it means for the United States. If we turn this around and instead try to look at the world as it appears to the Chinese government and leadership, here's what I arrive at. They are not liberalizing their economy. Why would they, right? Like the state control of the market has worked pretty well for them thus far. They're not going to liberalize their government because that could put them out of power. They are not going to abide by international law because that might be the biggest threat going forward to their, their, to their efforts of, at control and coercion. Rather, the way forward for China is, is not that they're going to liberalize the government economy and play by the international rules of the system. Rather, it's much more likely that they will try to replace Western norms with norms that are much more aligned with Beijing's interests. And if they can do that, if they can reshape the value system of the world, none of this matters. No one would look at it and say, well, they need to liberalize their economy because the Chinese system will have become normative. 
we will say, look at what's happening to Chinese ethnic minorities because that will become the normative way to deal with fifth column populations. And that's why I say, like, while the Western world has done a fair amount of harm worldwide over the last century and a half and, 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 and longer, longer, I'm just not an expert on history. I'm not convinced that a shift towards a Beijing led world will serve us well. I'm just not convinced of that. And look no further than the documentary I showed you for, for evidence of why that might be the case. So what can America do here? What's, what's, what can, if, look, again, I, there are two things I tend to believe about the 21st century. One is that America is not going to lead the world uh, anymore. But among a coalition of democratic nations, America would be in a position to be the leader of that group. And that might be enough to beat back the, the push of authoritarianism at the moment might be in the key, the operative term there. Many companies straight up collaborate with China. We can start sanctioning them, right? And, and, and Europe can start sanctioning them too. Europe might be more willing to do that than we are, honestly. We can start to compete in the telecommunications sector. This is an area where we're falling really far behind. And I think it will be, uh, it's gonna be very troubling to have a telecommunications system that's Chinese led and dominated going forward. When you've seen what they've done with the great firewall of China, that is something that's going to make communications and, 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 and exchange of information far less free over the next several years. We can maximize very, po and try to create very positive interactions with citizens. One of the best ways to guard against, now look, I, I want to be clear here. I don't think a war, like a shooting war between the United States and China is likely, but there's certainly a non-zero percent chance that it happens. One of the best safeguards against that would be if the average Chinese citizen has positive feelings about average American citizens and vice versa. So if we can take the governments out of it completely, and if the citizens themselves have positive feelings about each other and know more about each other, that's a safeguard. It's not the only thing, but it's a sa it, it is one of many safeguards you would need. Also, many people move out of China and they don't ever go back. Right? Like, I'm sure you've met Chinese immigrants somewhere in the United States, right? But there's also expat communities in places like Malaysia, India, large, many countries of Africa, you know, South Africa and um, Tanzania, um, in Australia and New Zealand, in Canada, especially on the west coast of Canada, engage with the expat communities. These are people who, are, who live currently and will continue to live, by and large, in a democracy. And expatriate communities are proven to be forces for change back in the home country because they're the ones that have the the example of the other. Hold that thought on the example of the other because I'm gonna I'm gonna be coming back to that. And we can also really work to strengthen our Asian allies. It's no surprise that Japan's um, country is weakening. It's aging. Um, it's ec its economy is shrinking. But a sort of coalition of Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, the Philippines maybe Indonesia, but probably not, um, along with Singapore uh, and, and along with may, uh, maybe Hong Kong, that could create a bit of a wall in opposition to Chinese spread of uh, treatment of, of ethnic minorities. That's the one I would care the most about in the short term. And then finally, getting to my sort of final points here, Realize that China is part of the world, not all of it. We make a big mistake if we think the world is China and China is the world. And the reason why we make that mistake is I think a lot of Americans, myself included, because I live here, um, are sort of prone at times, unless we check ourselves a bit, to thinking America is the world and the world is America and everything else is just within our sphere. That's a mistake for Americans to think that. It's a mistake when I think it. Let's not repeat that mistake by thinking that China is somehow the world just because it's the most populated country. And so what I'm wondering going forward, like if I take a very like wide angle look at history, 
If China is seeking to remake the world in this century, then what they are doing is kind of following our example from the 20th century. And what we were doing was following the British example of the 19th. And what the British were doing was following the French example of the 18th. And what the French were doing was following the Dutch example of the 17th. And they followed the Spanish and the Spanish followed the Portuguese and so on and so forth. Every century has one country that like kind of, that's their century more so than anybody else. Um, and what I would like to see, one of, the, one of the ways that we can stop the negative elements of the Chinese kind of regime's way of doing things from becoming normative and established is, is to realize that China is able to step into this void now due to some of the damage that occurred in the second half of the 20th century, which was the American century. And so if I look around the world, right, like the part of the reason that Chinese money is so readily accepted in sub-Saharan African countries, right, trapping them in debt regimes that they can never get out of, is a byproduct of neocolonialism that created unstable, corrupt countries, and, and no one really ever tried to do anything about that. Part of the reason that China's viewed favorably in Central America is American actions in Central America have created massive population and economic problems that have really never been solved. And so America needs to take some accountability for this and start working. Like if we can improve the world, I realize now this is starting to sound like a little pie in the sky, but the best way to beat back Chinese transmission of anti-democratic values might be to make the rest of the world a little more resistant to it. And that might involve making America the leader that it always said it was and never quite got to. And having that counterexample, having a big positive counterexample it's probably what China fears the most, right? What China fears the most, I really think this is, is a, a very functional and like, very functional Western world because that becomes the counter example. So I want to go back here. I, and the last thing I'm going to say here is, is this example of a cross-national other. I sometimes wonder about this guy, this, this wild-haired uh, Slovenian sociologist. Um, is a, so, a, a sociologist named uh, Slavo Zizek. And uh, a lot of his work is very postmodern and I don't read very much of it. But I heard him speak once at a conference where I thought he stumbled into a really insightful point. And his argument was that the collapse of the Soviet Union and the creation of that unipolar world the enduring cultural legacy of that yeah, is that it took away the other. So the United States and the USSR, the fact that those were ideologically opposed countries, they gave each other politically an enemy that they could sort of like round the people around. But it also gave them a very useful counterexample of the other. And his argument is essentially this. The fact that you had a strong communist country as a rival for the 45 years of the Cold War, that served to hold the United States to a higher standard and vice versa. And in the absence of that, there is no cross-national thing that can hold you to a higher standard. So the way that the, the way that America actually will benefit, there's 99 ways in which the world doesn't benefit from this. There's one big way in which it does. If America can look at China and say, that is, that is our rival. And what we are going to do is improve our country in relation to it and work to mend our relationship with Europe and work to help Mexico overcome its corruption issues and work to stabilize South American governments that are prone, that are like just hemorrhaging money through tax evasion and so on and so forth. 
then China becomes the example of the other that actually shores up, um, you know, this system of Western values that we all proclaim to like. I mean, like it's 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 very easy to criticize the United States sometimes, but it's a much it like nobody. I, I don't hear anybody seriously arguing that the move is to basically become China. <laughs> like, I don't hear that. So it's not about destroying the United States. It's not even about transforming the United States. It's about holding it to a higher standard. And that's what I hope we will do over the rest of my lifetime. Um, thank you so much, guys. Have a great weekend. And Group A, I'm going to see you back in my classroom on uh, Monday. Have a great weekend and take care.